namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa muttang dhammang sankhang namasami So I'd like to ask uh, permission from the Venerable Mahateras and the Sangha. I express my greetings to all the lay people here today. One of Ajahn Chah's constant reminders was that the most valuable thing we can do is, with our whole lives in fact, is to make our minds peaceful. So we've all come from different places perhaps and had some activity in the last hour or so, so perhaps we can just start by sitting quietly, compose our minds, to hear Dhamma, to reflect on Dhamma, and prepare to, to bring that Dhamma into our lives, just for a few minutes, a very short time, just to establish ourselves here, just some quiet breathing. So today is a, a day of remembering uh, an individual person, but perhaps more importantly, uh, a life well lived and teachings given and uh, a practice undertaken and taken to its fullness, its fruition. The important thing for all of us, students, of the Dhamma from whatever tradition, lay or monastic, is of course to reflect on how, how we can bring these uh, teachings, this, the, the life of an individual, into our own lives in a way where it becomes a modern day reality. This morning we heard from somebody who was fortunate Ajahn Sumedho, very lucky to have spent many years living with Ajahn Chah. And this evening there will be other speakers who lived with him directly. I've been asked to speak today as uh, a monk ordained in the tradition, out of faith in Buddha Dhamma, but also having contacted Ajahn Chah to a certain degree. But I can't say that he was my direct teacher in the same way. I never got the chance to sit at his feet and hear the stories, hear the jokes, or get the, the hard teachings, be admonished. When he was fierce, he was very fierce. When he was warm, he was very warm. So I, I never got that directly. But I was fortunate enough to pay my respects to him while he was still alive. But by that time, he was already very sick. He had had a... a a serious medical condition for many years, was unable to speak, was virtually and paralyzed. Yet, that meeting with him and that chance to be around him just for a short time, but more importantly to come into close contact with the tradition that was already growing up around him and was being slowly established and was already thriving actually, was enough to feel this was an individual who I could really give my life to. And in fact, there was no other, no other thing that seemed logical to do. So perhaps as a, as a Dhamma sharing today, just to share 
um, some of that um, with everybody. In May of 1989, I had taken a, a temporary Samanera ordination in Thailand, partly as a, an interesting experience. I was 18 years old, partly as an offering to my family, my Thai family, but not really knowing anything about Buddhism, Buddhist practice, meditation, or the tradition. At the time, I could not speak Thai, and so by good fortune, my Upaja, my preceptor, sent me to Wat Banana Chat, which uh, Ajahn Sumedho spoke about this morning, the monastery for Westerners, where the language of instruction given was in English. And so that was the real first encounter, you could say, with Ajahn Chah, simply arriving in a monastery of his tradition. One already felt his presence. And in many ways, it wasn't easy. It wasn't a welcome presence. Because simply put, it was physically very demanding. Rising very early, 3 a.m., long bindabata, morning chanting, meditation, uh, difficult conditions, and monks practicing seemed very strictly, very little talking going on. And myself not knowing anything about the tradition, unable to meditate, lonely, and wondering what it was really all about, it all seemed very austere. And the, uh, some of the chants we would do in morning and evening chanting also, I found very jarring. On the, on the boards outside in the exhibition, you see the, the words, Jara Damomi, Jara Nganatito. So we used to chant this, Jara Damomi, Jara Nganatito. I am of the nature to age, I have not gone beyond aging. It seemed very somber, uh, negative and depressing. Bayadi damomi, bayadi nganati do, I am of the nature to sicken, I have not gone beyond sickness. Marana damomi, marana nganati do, I am of the nature to die, I have not gone beyond death. I couldn't really understand why we needed to start the day in this particular way. Surely there could be something a bit more uplifting. And then we would move on to contemplating the body. And we chant uh, these 32 parts, many of you are familiar with, going through hair of the head, hair of the nails, teeth, skin, uh, and then internal organs as well, heart, lungs, onto intestines, and the other more unattractive and usually um, less, uh, less, less desirable parts of the body. And again, I couldn't quite understand why we were focusing on the fact that, as the chant goes, this body is a sealed bag of skin filled with unattractive things. I thought, this Ajahn Chah must be very strange to teach his disciples to chant this. I, I didn't realize that actually these words went back to the original Buddha. I had su such little understanding. So I was learning day by day, and it wasn't easy. And I wasn't really sure if I would be able to hang in there for more than a week or two. But one thing there was to look forward to would be, I was told we would go and pay respects to Ajahn Chah, the great master himself, in a few days' time. It was the tradition that on the Lunar Observance Day, the Sangha would uh, all get into uh, pickup trucks and drive over a few kilometers to Wat Nong Ba Pong, his monastery, and pay respects to Ajahn Chah. And I was told, then I would get a chance to, to, to finally see Ajahn Chah, and I was very happy about that. So I'd heard so much about him, seen so many lovely pictures. He seemed this uh, being full of smiling metta and the wisdom. Uh, everybody seemed so inspired. I thought, this, this will really help me. But that meeting was, uh, again, very, very difficult. It was almost disturbing. We would drive to the monastery and then park and then go to his kuti, the hut where he was being looked after. I, I, I'd been told that well, he doesn't teach very much anymore because he's sick. But I wasn't expecting the sight of Ajahn Chah, uh, very frail, uh, looking tiny compared to this larger-than-life figure in the pictures. Without his false teeth, his whole face sunken in, and being wheeled out by, by two uh, attendant monks, both wearing uh, uh, masks covering their mouth for hygiene. It just seemed like a very um, grim picture. What a, what, a, what a traumatic scene. 
So again, those of you that, that uh, have seen the exhibition or afterwards, there are pictures of, of that period of his life in a wheelchair, uh, paralyzed, unable to speak, even with a, with a, with a bandage, a, a plaster over his throat, covering the, the tracheotomy tube where, where he was fed. So this is a very powerful image. I was brought up, I'd been brought up in London. And in the West, as many of you know, um, suffering of that kind, uh, old age, uh, sickness, is not really brought out into the public sphere. And certainly young people don't make a special effort to go and pay respects to people who are old and sick and, and make that a big part of their week and sit contemplating somebody who's old and sick. And we did the chanting and then there was a period of silent meditation and the attendant monks were fanning away the mosquitoes. And then we paid respects, bowed, and they wheeled Ajahn Chah back into his hospital kuti. And there's this sense of deep, deep disappointment. Because the feeling, the thought arose in me, well, I, I won't be able to learn anything from the master if he's in this state. And then another thought, another nagging doubt about Buddhism arose because I'd been, I'd been learning about the law of karma, that good actions bring good results, and I thought, well, well, if this is the enlightened master who surely did so much good action in his life, if, 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 if this is what it comes to, then, then, then what chance is there for someone like me? So I was thinking about this Buddhism. It didn't seem to offer much of a, much of a solution or... So as we were putting our ropes on and getting back into the pickup trucks, I commented to, to one of the monks. I said, oh, you know, isn't it a pity that, 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 that Ajahn Chah has to suffer so much? And he, he kind of, he knew I was uh, new to this Dhamma. So he sort of smiled and, and said, said to me, why do you think he's suffering? And then it was time to get in the pickup trucks. But, but that answer was very, very powerful, actually. With hindsight, it's very powerful because it wasn't a refutation. It wasn't necessarily saying, no, 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 he's not suffering, he's enlightened. He was simply asking me to reflect on my own bias, my own preconception that somebody f physically sick, aging, unable to move, unable to speak, uh, with, a, with a hole in their throat to, to, to be fed, with needing monks attending you 24 hours a day, that that person would necessarily be suffering. That was my assumption, and that the Dhamma hadn't seemed to work for them. So luckily there was something in me that said, yes, why, why do I assume that he's suffering?